We have uh, continued uh, completed our prostrations. We're very happy. We welcome you, and we will be uh, going ahead. And I made just a couple announcements. All good for questions to be in the chat box, and we will be sharing the screen a moment for the uh, mandala offering. Good. So, sorry, I missed. I just need to get Venable in the spotlight. Venable Urbina, could you please say something? Uh, thank you. Lars, Venable Urbina is already in spotlight. She's in the spotlight. Good. Great. We'll right, so, we, so good, we start our next phase of your session. I presume you've been there together for 30 minutes. So this next phase, we think um, we're going to make this offering. Lars is going to sing the offering, or someone is. And what we're thinking is, you know, we're going to imagine, just use your creative imagination, thinking of all the marvellous things of the world. Hang on, I want to close my window. Think of all the marvellous things of the world. All the marvelous things that make people happy, basically, all the objects of the senses. Just imagine offering these to the Buddha. That's it, you know. And, and as a request for the teachings, thinking this way. And this is second prayer too. We're requesting, you know, to have the to, to turn the wheel of Dharma. So good. You think like this, okay? Uh, Sashi Perky. Yuxingeto perfect pure holy gurus from the billowing clouds of wisdom and compassion in the sky of the Dharmakaya. Please let fall a rain of profound and extensive Dharma upon the receptacle of those to be subdued exactly as they need. Now I'll lead the next one. This is uh, reminding of our, ourselves of our reliance on the Buddha and his teachings and then making this aspiration that we're going to listen to these teachings. Why? You know, so we can take some tools from it to develop our own amazing potential so we can become a Buddha to benefit transmigrating beings, as it says. And we'll, so I'll say one time in English, a bit extra words just to get clear the, the thought, and then we'll sing two times in Tibetan. So we're saying, until I'm enlightened, you know, could be many lifetimes, so we've got a long-term view here. I'm going to rely upon, it's the meaning of refuge, I'm going to rely upon the Buddha, his teachings, and then the spiritual community whom we practice with. So by the virtuous karmic seeds that I plant in my mind, by listening to these teachings, may I become a Buddha. May these seeds ripen in the future as my Buddhahood, because then I'll be perfectly qualified, having developed the two wings of the bird, wisdom and compassion, to be of benefit to all sentient beings. Sange chodang toke tong nam la jantu badu dagni kyapsu chi dagi chon yen gi pesonam ki drola penche sange drupa shog Sange chodang toke tong nam la jantu badu dagni kyapsu chi dagi chon yen gi pesonam ki drola penche sange drupa shog Thank you, Lars. Okay, so to summarize, what we've done the last two times is look at them in general, look at the mind, you know, in general, the general Buddhist approach to the mind, getting us familiar with this very, in many ways, radically different view of this mind of ours, this consciousness. It's not physical. This is an absolute, this is an absolutely fundamental assumption to take or hypothesis that we need to work with in order to study the Buddhist view, you know, that it's not physical. It is not the handiwork of anybody else that it doesn't begin in the mother's womb. And in fact, it's a product of the series of causes 
the f and the first and and of course beginningless because if you have cause and effect you can't have a first cause so one of the fundamental qualities of mind and this is a nutty idea to us is it's beginningless it's quite shocking to hear this you know and from the mahayana and from the prasangika madhyamika point of view in the mahayana the mind is endless some of the buddhist teachings some of the buddhist interpretations actually say that when you've achieved buddhahood or achieved your own nirvana your mind ends this is a radically different point as well for as far as this this view is concerned the one we're discussing here well, this view, this text we're going to be discussing now is actually from the from um, <clears throat> the uh, from the Theravadan point of view, which is you know the basis of or one of the schools of thought in the in the Hinayana point of view. I'm pretty sure, yeah. And so there's many different views in there, but in general, these views about the mind and, it's, and the parts we're going to discuss today, the mental factors they call them, they uh, they they're similar, they're shared similar. But the Prasangika Majjhima view of the mind is it never ends because once you've achieved Buddhahood. Then you continually manifest in different bodies throughout space, throughout universes to benefit sentient beings as long as is necessary. So, right there, the mind is another whole kettle of fish, isn't it? If you compare with the, um, the materialist philosophical view. So, then the other way we discuss mind, this is you know, in general, we've discussed that there's two ways our mind functions. One is through the sen is sensory consciousness, and one is mental consciousness. And these are completely different and that we and we and so and then there's and then there's two ways of dividing there's two ways of looking at how the mind functions so one is the the, the epistemological model of the mind which is the way the mind works which is totally fascinating and then the other one is the psychological model and that's what i want to talk about today in other words the names of the different parts of our mind you know our mind is so first of all like you know as we as we've been discussing the definition in order to discuss anything you need to define your terms don't you you need to be clear what are we discussing here so i say i have a thermos well what's a thermos rabina i'll give you the definition you know we better be clear about that so the definition of mind and generally you can say a definition <clears throat> has two parts you know there's the uh the first part tells you that generally speaking the first part of a definition tells you the conventional characteristics of something so if i say what you know mummy what's a thermos she'll tell me the definition the first part she'll tell me and you will see this it's a flat bottomed metal container or you know a tube metal that's good we can see that but the second part is the crucial piece that tells us its job its function what does it do even you could say what is its meaning <clears throat> you think about it well oh well sweetheart she'll tell me it holds my tea and keeps it warm so then, of course, you've got to prove that's true and, you, and so on and so forth. So what's the mind? Well, the definition of mind is going to be very short and sweet. It just you can almost use two words, you know, plus and it's that which is clear. And here it means not physical. Sometimes they say luminous, which sounds a bit romantic, but it means not physical. But then it's job. What's its job? The second part. And this is the crucial piece. It's it's to know clear and knowing how they sometimes is putting it so the verb to know the verb to cognize the verb in general to be aware these are all synonyms and they are the function of mind so then of course the question would immediately come up well to know what mummy to cognize what to be aware of what well buddha would say guess what honey that which exists finally that is the, the job of the mind and the entire job of being a buddhist and it sounds almost simplistic but it's utterly the truth the entire job of being a buddhist the actual 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 job of being a buddhist is on the basis of becoming intimately familiar with this mind and how it functions and its contents the job is to then unpack and unravel and wreak and, and rid the mind of all the rubbish which is the stuff that causes us to not cognize that which exists and to be fully in touch with those parts of our mind that are in touch with that which exists and that's finally what a buddha is you know and as we've been discussing mind is absolutely central it's not just some interesting extra topic it's 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 the knower of all it's the knower of all the knower of that which exists and not only that but as we've been hearing often enough what goes on in our mind very simply very clearly for the buddha what goes on in our mind is the main cause of happiness and suffering 
So there's huge vested interest in being, in knowing the mind as far as being a Buddhist is concerned, because that's what you're developing. That's what you're transforming. That's what you're fixing. That's what you're, because that's what knows reality. And that's what knows ridiculous rubbish. And that's what causes suffering and causes happiness. So it's, it's, it's absolutely vital. And so, of course, you can study this in great depth. I mean, in, this, in the, in the monastic, Tibetan monastic universities system, you can study it for a couple of years. I mean, you know, in our in our in our programs, our study programs like the basic program, the the FPMT, the master's program. You know, one can I think study it for many months. The text quite extensive, but here in our discovering Buddhism program, you know, we're just, we're studying it for this six weeks. But of course, we're going to continue to study it because in the in the module that's called Nirvana and Samsara Nirvana, which is where we look into the second scope of Buddhist teachings and the Four Noble Truths. Here, we're going to be looking into the mind as well, obviously. And then again, when you learn about karma, you're looking at the mind because the mind is what creates karma. So you can't avoid the mind, you know. Understanding suffering, understanding happiness, it always comes down to the mind. Understanding the way the mind works, it's the contents, it's the mind, you know. Understand emptiness, what, you know, understanding ultimate reality, it's the mind. Understanding bodhicitta, practicing bodhicitta, it's the mind. Everything comes to the mind. Okay. So I think T.Y. in her notes, T.Y. Alexander, if you've read your course notes, she goes into the different uh, states of mind. But here I'm just going to be referring occasionally to Geshe Tashi, this book that I've that's in the notes that is recommended, published by Wisdom, by Geshe Tashi, who was the resident teacher at our centre in London for many years, but who has at the moment been appointed by His Holiness, I think, as the abbot of Sarah May Monastery, the sister monastery of Sarah J, our Lama's monastery in South India. And this is published many years ago by Wisdom. So it's uh, using his, his explanation because it, he taught it to Westerners. So it's kind of very geared to our ears or modern people. It's geared to our ears, you know. So he discusses what the mind is and then he discusses, you know, it's, it's, it's a definition, mind and, and, and uh, mind clarity and cognition. So, okay, so we can, so we're looking in the, in the psychological model of the mind, which is the contents of the mind. We'll look at the epistemological model later. We've touched upon that briefly. But here we're discussing, and I just, but just, but just to refer, just to turn back, but to turn to a point I always make, which is coming from the epistemological model, or it's a reference point for what we're going to discuss now. This is a, a really powerful thing to understand. You know, in our culture, we kind of think of me. And me is this lump of, you know, lump of body. We're so attached to our bodies. We make the body the boss. And then, of course, when we study the mind, we study the brain. So it's always emphasis on the physical, isn't it? And then, of course, because, you know, the body, the, so we have sensory consciousness and mental. Let's just look at this briefly before, just remind us, before we go into the contents of the mind, we look at the, the different mental factors as they refer to them. I mean, we might use the term states of mind you know, a state of mind. Mental factor is the term they use in Tibetan. So, okay. So it's really powerful to remember, and I use this example all the time. You're familiar with it probably. I say, what's that, mummy? And she says a thermos. She tells me what it is. I then have to check what it is and so on and so forth. But this is the point here. I discussed this, I think, last week or the week before. I say, oh, what a wonderful thermos. I will point to a thermos and instantly I'll tell you because I chose it on the basis of its design. You know, I looked online. I know what I like. I know the design I like. I know what the shape I like. I know the color I like. So I chose this one. So I'll say it's a well-designed thermos. And so, of course, we can obviously we'll, we'll assume my eyeball is seeing a well-designed thermos. Well, no, not possible. And this is, this is the simple point I want to make here to remind us of the utter distinction between sensory and mental consciousness. This is massive, you know. So sensory is the, yeah, indeed, so the Buddha's way of putting it is eye consciousness. And we're not discussing the eyeball. We're discussing the part of our mind that functions through the medium of the eyeball. So, okay, in Buddha's view, there's a subtler physical energy that they call it the, uh, the sense base, but we never, don't worry about that now. So we know we've got an eyeball. And we know it's got all these nerves and bits and pieces. And when the lid is open and the lights are on, you have a you can see something. But the Buddha's way of putting it is it's my my eye consciousness working along with the physical, the eyeball, you know, has a cognition. Because like I said last week, I think every state of mind is, if you like, you can say it's the subject. And whatever the mind cognizes is an object. And when we go into the epistemological model, we can go into details of the different ways 
the different kinds of ways the mind cognizes the object, the different objects that the mind can cognize. Okay, so here, what is the object of an eye consciousness? Well, we would say it's a it's a it's a well it's a well designed thermos. Technically, not. I the all the sensory consciousness is a profoundly limited in their capacity for cognition. So the, the, the way to put it, spelling it out, that the eye consciousness, its only object of knowledge, its only object that, that, the, that the eye consciousness can cognize is called shape and color. Two things, shape, color. Ear consciousness, sound. Tactile consciousness, rough, smooth. They're very limited. But look at the power we give our senses. In other words, we give inappropriate power to senses. We give way more power to our senses than they actually have. And we do that because we experience things through our senses. We have feelings through our senses. So we make the body hugely the boss, which is simply inappropriate. But this is already a very profound point. Your eye consciousness is not capable of cognizing a well-designed thermos. So you, then you must ask the question, well, what part of my mind is cognizing a well-designed thermos? Well, guess what? The millisecond my eye consciousness, you know, meets this shape and color <laughs> in a millionth of a second, quicker than Google. I say that as a joke, but it's deadly true. My mental consciousness is accessed. And what's that? Because that's what we're going to discuss today. That's that's your that's the that's your that's where the workshop is, as Lama Zopa says. And what is in, in there at the level we function at the moment, at a very gross level, they are all conceptual thoughts. Our mental consciousness, we live at the level of conceptuality. And even that is a surprise to us because we, we think of emotions, you know, but conceptuality, and so in your mental consciousness, you're containing <coughs> even the ones we can remember millions of thoughts are all flying around in there and that's what we have to start to work with that's the workshop we have to start unpacking and unraveling the contents of our mental consciousness to begin to become intimately familiar with it why so we can identify the rubbish mental concepts and lessen them and grow and and and, and grow and develop the positive concepts that's our job so it's a it's a, a well-designed thermos is an opinion a viewpoint a concept and this is what we're going to be discussing you know so there's a text <coughs> that's studied always in the monasteries that we're <coughs> that you study in more depth and it's called and this is based on this it's called lorig mind and awareness or my, maybe mind and awareness lorig mind and awareness there's different words for mind you know one of the words for mind is sem and rig is awareness, mind and awareness. <clears throat> so in here, in the, in the psychological model, they list 51 different mental factors or states of mind. In fact, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands. But these 51 over the centuries, has been always, they've always been pointed out and studied. But first of all, before we even get to those, in the mental level, we can divide mind into two parts. They call it, the, or Geshe Tashi translates, main mind. Sometimes people call it primary, but he prefers the word main mind, and then the mental factors. So the way they talk about main mind, it seems pretty abstract to us. Because it's, it's one example he uses, they often use this like, that's the screen. And then that's the screen of a movie. And then all the mental factors are all the bits and pieces that go on on the screen. So you've got your main mind, which is just sort of there, neither positive nor negative. And then you all have the players, which is the mental factors, you know. I mean, we can get very caught up intellectually with this idea, but they and they work utterly together. You can't have one without the other. And it's extremely hard to actually be conscious of the main mind, but they just how they talk. You've got the main mind and you have the mental factors, you know. So there's six, they call about six main minds. You've got the six senses, and then you have the, 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 uh, the, 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 um, the central, the, 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 the mental main mind. So the sensory main mind and mental main mind. That's how they talk. One each for each of the senses. And then there's the mental consciousness, the main mind. So and they, always, they always go together. There's so much more you can say about it, but that's enough. And you can read TY's notes and you'll get it. So now, so then you've got your six sensory consciousnesses, and then you have your mental factors, and these are the ones I want to discuss. Okay. So um, so the, the Tibetan mental factor is translated, actually, Geshe says, as phenomena arising from the mind. So these states of mind are like things that arise from the main mind. That's how they talk about it. Yeah. 
So it's defined as an aspect of the mind that apprehends a particular quality of the object. In other words, there, we just say, oh, I, you know, I'm cognizing a thermos, I'm cognizing a computer, I'm looking at a chair. But there's in the same way we talk about the brain, but the here the cognitive process itself, the subjective non-physical cognitive process itself, there's so many parts of our mind all working beautifully together to have a simple cognition of cognizing something, you know? So that's what we have to learn to understand. And this is, and, the, and if we, of course, if the mind is what we have to try and turn into the mind of a Buddha, it's fairly evident we need to really understand it, you know. And remember, this knowledge comes from these Indians before the Buddha. Okay, Buddha's got this own, their own take on all this, but this is coming from the, the work of the amazing Indian yogis well before the Buddha, you know. So then in, in the Abhidharma, he quotes that these 51 mental factors, these 51 different states of mind, they are divided into six groups. All this is in T.Y. Alexander's course notes, you know. The first lot, there are those that are referred to as the always present mental factors. So in other words, they're always playing, they're always there continuously, and there are five of these. Then there's another group called the object ascertaining, the object ascertaining mental factors. Then there's a group called the wholesome or the virtuous mental factors. Then there's a group called the main mental afflictions or the main delusions. There's another group called, he calls it the derivative, but I mean, you know, secondary mental afflictions. And then the sixth group is called the variable mental factors. So we'll go through each of these groups just briefly, okay? But it's very fascinating. All these are the parts of our mind, what's working. So these first five are working all the time. So of course, unless we know these, we're not conscious at all. You know, we don't think of all these bits and pieces all doing their job. Just like if you didn't know neuroscience, you wouldn't think of all the bits of the brain doing their job, you know. <laughs> so the five always present. So these five are always present every millisecond, every millisecond, every cognition we have. And you could say if any one of these are missing, you'd, you'd be mentally ill. So if the first one is called contact. The second is called discernment, or sometimes it's referred to as discrimination. The third one is called feeling. The fourth is intention, and the fifth is attention. And there's this relationship between these, you know? So all, all these are present, even if it's just for the millionth of a second, they're always there doing their bit, you know? And if each of these is working properly, then you have a valid cognition. If some of these are really hopeless, like just discrimination, it's completely, discrimination, for example, is the ability millisecond by millisecond to distinguish between this and that. And by the way, all these states of mind, interestingly, there's another way of looking, and I've mentioned, I mentioned this a lot, we can divide all our states of mind into these three categories of their being deluded, non-virtuous, ridiculous, non-valid cognitions. There are those that are valid, that are virtuous or wholesome. And then there are the third lot that are neither virtuous nor non-virtuous. Every one of these will be in, in, in that category. The, you know, contact, dis discrimination. I mean, a, a, a sniper would need very good discrimination, wouldn't they? Because they'll kill the wrong person. It's not good or bad. It's neither virtuous nor non-virtuous. It's just like, that's why I like to call these the mechanics of the mind, you know? Feeling, for example, is so fascinating. We spend the whole day just on feeling. We'll go into it. So what's contact? Well, the very it's the very first thing. It's, it's very mechanical. You can't begin a process of cognition if you don't first make, the mind doesn't make contact with its object. Contact. It always has to be there. Without that, you can't go further. So just merely contact between the object and the consciousness, you know? I've got my allergies today, sneezing. Santa Fe is famous for its allergies, apparently. I'm learning all about it. So, okay. So, you know, um, okay, yeah. Contact is the very first thing that you have to have in your mental process. It's a simple act of the mind meeting an object. So remember, the mind is subject, object is that which it cognizes. The subject, object, subject, object. The mind is always subject. And it always, every second of mind, every moment of mind always has something it cognizes. Contact is the first thing. It's logical, as Geshe -la says, you know. So next one is discernment and discrimination. This is massive. You know, you, discrimination and feeling, you notice the Buddha puts a big deal on these. If he talks about the five aggregates, for example, which is one of his teachings on what makes up a human being, what makes up a person, these five little piles of things, he, 
He, he gives special attention to dis discrimination and feeling. So we've got form, feeling, discrimination, and then the other, so to make up, because these two play such a powerful role in our acting out of samsara, you know. So the, so the mind receives raw data through contact, Ishala says, you know, but it's, there's no, it hasn't been processed yet. So therefore the next mental factor is, and because these are in a, in a linear order, in a, in a, in a chronological order, um, is discernment or discrimination. It functions to note the characteristics of the object. In other words, to discriminate between this and that. So if you know, if you're colorblind, you know, you haven't got, you can't discriminate between yellow and red, for example. If you, you know, I remember hearing about one woman who had, who was gradually losing what I would suggest is this capacity. She'd look at the table, all the con all the objects on the table, and she could no longer discriminate the shapes and things. She'd have to use other parts of her mind to, to notice there was the teapot and there was the cup. She couldn't see the shapes. She could not any longer discriminate them. And it was very scary for her, you know? So discrimination, good discrimination. So if we're trying to practice Dharma, we absolutely need good discrimination because that's the key one to notice when you look at your mind, you have to discriminate. Is that a negative state of mind or a positive one? If you don't have that, you're useless. You can't get, you can't practice, you know? So this is an absolutely vital state of mind, which again is neutral in its character. It's just a mechanics, but depending on how you use it, you use it for virtue or non-virtue, you know? So dis discrimination is always present, Yeshala says, but it's, it, it's sometimes very weak. The next one is fascinating. This, is, this one is utterly fascinating, actually, and it's called feeling. And it, and it seems odd to put it in here as a neutral state of mind or as sort of a neither good nor bad, because the word way we use feeling is very powerful. We live according to our feelings. We think of them as emotions, don't we? Another word for emotions is feelings. But that's not the way they're talking here. It's very, very precisely used. So there's only three kinds of feeling we could ever have in the way we're using it here. And again, it's neither virtuous nor non-virtuous. This takes time to think. I'll give some examples. So we either have pleasant feelings, unpleasant feelings, or neutral feelings. Now let's forget the neutral. They're valid, but let's forget those. All we care about, isn't it, is the pleasant and the unpleasant. They are, they are, they are another word for pleasant feeling, literally is the word happiness. Happy feelings, pleasant feelings, you know, what, and there's a spectrum of those, isn't there? There's like bliss. I mean, we say bliss very easily, but I mean, I'm waiting for a blissful feeling, having one of those yet. A very, very, very delicious, pleasant feeling, in other words. We, we can see there's a spectrum, the mildest pleasant feeling to the most intensely blissful pleasant feeling. And we all know we want those. This is so, this is what drives everything. We are junkies for those. And the next one is unpleasant. Well, what's another word for that? Suffering. Suffering. Another word is synonymous is unpleasant feeling. So we know there's a spectrum of those, the mildest unpleasant feeling to the most intense agonizing pain. You know, we know these words so intimately. And so, of course, if we look at now, we're going to get into it in a minute, into the non-virtuous states of mind, like attachment. This is like the motor that drives us. It's the junkie that drives us. It's just my way of saying it. You know, they don't say it in the text like that. And its job is to, fi is to find the object of the senses, for example, first make contact, and then on the basis of contact with that, to discriminate it as chocolate cake, and then to put it in the mouth. Why? Because you want to trigger a pleasant feeling. So everything we do in our daily life, and this is what samsara is, is, is we've tried to get contact with things that will trigger a pleasant feeling and avoid contact with things that will trigger an unpleasant feeling. Think about your life, you know. So this word is enormous. But part of the problem with this one, part of the problem with pleasant feeling, we don't discriminate between attachment, which is considered a delusion for the Buddha. And as far as he's concerned, you know, it's this, the main source of our suffering in daily life. We'll get to that category in a minute. We, we equate pleasant feelings with attachment. That's why we get all this guilt, you know. We think, and that's why, because we, we conflate these two. As Lama Zopa says, when we hear the Buddha says, sorry, guys, you've got to, you know, to get happy, you've got to give up attachment. 
we go, oh, I've got to give up my heart. I've got to give up my happiness because we, we don't think that they're different, but they're totally separate parts of mind. I mean, this is very, very technical and very intellectual because it's a joke to say they're separate. They come virtuously together, virtually together, but they don't, they do, there's an order to them, you know? So for example, if you've got some strong karmic connection with food, most of us have, we love our food, attached to our food, but let's say certain habit to eat sweet things, then you know the mind you make contact with the, the, the object and discrimination sees that it's that you use these different parts of your mind to label it chocolate cake. But the millisecond you see it because of the habit from eating food, instantaneously a pleasant after contact, discrimination, and then pleasant feeling kicks in. Then next comes, and this is not in this category, but later, next will come attachment that will paint an extremely exaggerated, delicious picture of that object. So then naturally, because it looks delicious, and naturally because mere contact with that chocolate cake triggered pleasant feelings, we logically deduce that the cake is the main cause of that pleasant feeling. That's the wrong analysis. And this is profound, you know, this is really huge to, to understand intellectually. <clears throat> That's why, for example, a person who's got the past karma to kill, always that example I use of a fisherman, this little boy, the first time he went fishing, he made contact with the scenario called fishing, discrimination kicked in, you know, in, but instantly then, then, then happy feeling came in instantaneously because of the strength of his past karma, instantaneously without any kind of decision very very pleasant feelings kicked in and then the next trillionth of a second attachment takes over and paints an extremely delicious picture of fishing and that's what kept him fishing all his life that's what causes us that's what keeps us in samsara we maybe not go killing fish we maybe eat cakes and jump on boys or you know buy handbags it's the habit, it's there. And the strength of your habit is equal to the strength of the feeling. This is kind of very sobering, you know. In other words, as Geshe says, feeling in general is what drives us. Because we're junk, we want the good feelings, don't we? Think about it. There's never a millisecond, and not a millisecond in your day that you're neither having, that you're either not having feeling pleasant or unpleasant. Forget, like I said, forget the neutral. But we're, we, you know, and we want the pleasant and can't stand the unpleasant. That's what drives the whole of our mechanics of samsara, you know. So we have to unpack and unravel and, and look into and analyze this process, these parts of our mind. So as he says, once we've discerned an object, contact with it, discriminated between this and that, or discerned it as this and that, then feeling kicks in, you know. The things I've said, right. So feeling is a mental event. It's, we're talking mental here. Think of this now. This is very fascinating. We're talking about the mental consciousness, but it's very closely associated with the main minds of the senses. It's, it's clear, isn't it? Because we would never think we have a mental state of happiness. We think it's the senses, isn't it? But the mental, it's a, we're discussing a mental state here. This is very fascinating. We're discussing a mental state not a sensory, but as Geshe says, it's very connected to the senses. The main mind of the eye consciousness can see a sunset, but it is but it is feeling that causes us to enjoy it. So you see that the eye conscious sees that shape and color, you discriminate it as sunset, pleasant feelings kick in. So you, it's, it's a surprise to hear that we're describing a mental state. It's very fascinating. Yeah. But, it, but also, as he's saying here, generally, even though it's a mental state that we're discussing, feeling is almost always associated with our sensory consciousness. If we have a joyful feeling while remembering a, a past event, although there's a memory and hence a mental consciousness, that mental state has occurred because of its association with sensory consciousness. So it's, they're very intimately linked. And this is why it's a, it's a revelation <clears throat> to be able to unpack and unravel and identify the different parts of our mind. So we can start to see it as something, not just some co kind of incoherent lump of feeling without analysis, you know. So he talks about how feeling arises through four conditions, the natural condition, training, mental disposition and personality. I mean, so he... So yeah, I won't go into all that because we haven't got time to go into everything. You can read it all in T.Y.'s notes. 
But this one of feeling is enormous. Look at it, you know, absolutely enormous. And that's where you can see, you know, for hours, you know, for example, you use the example of if, you know, like you have pleasant feeling and you convince it's the chocolate cake that causes it. But we all know as you keep eating the same, you know, the chocolate cake, that the next piece and the next piece and the next piece, all these, you know, start, these things start to change, isn't it? And the very chocolate cake that we were convinced in the beginning was the source of happy feelings now becomes a source of unhappy feelings. I mean, we know this experience, but we never question it. We never join the dots, you know. And the next day, of course, we completely forget that that, that that chocolate cake was the cause of you wanting to vomit. We only remember the fleeting moment of pleasant feeling, and we're hungry for that again. So we, we, we sink, we launch into the chocolate cake again, bashing our heads against brick walls, you know. So, you know, for example, anyway, never mind all these four conditions that affect feeling. So feeling is this word, it's a mental state, which is a big surprise to us, but it works intimately closely with the sensory consciousness, even in your memory, even if, you know, when you have fantasies, people live in their fantasy world, like if you have a fantasy about having contact with your handsome new boyfriend, it's because your mind is so capable, there's no contact with the boyfriend, he's not even there. And there's no senses being touched by your boyfriend, but the feelings that come is because of the memory of the sensory, you know, it's so powerful, isn't it? Feeling, you know, pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, and it's a mental state. So karma, when we talk about karma, this is what's very sobering. When we talk about karma, what we're going to know, what we're going to know is this, every second, there's no discussion in here, but it doesn't come into the mind, but it's interesting to know it here. Every moment, of happy feeling that we experience every millisecond of anything that's a happy feeling that is the actual cause of it the cake is the trigger okay but the um the main the direct the main cause of that moment of pleasant feeling is a past virtuous action this is very sobering every second of unpleasant feeling every second every millisecond is the fruit of a past non-virtuous action. This is the technical explanation of what is the actual cause of a pleasant feeling. So in other words, Buddhist teachings are saying the actual cause of happiness. We hear it. Oh, the cause of happiness is to be virtuous. It sounds kind of boring. You know, it sounds like someone's going to reward you with happiness. And you think, oh, I'm being a good girl. Now I deserve happiness. But it's a technical thing. It's technical. Every millisecond of any pleasant feeling, each one of those is the fruit of a past virtue. And this is why the tragedy is an extra component here of we think it's the chocolate cake and attachment kicks in and makes it look divine. We believe it's the cake that's the cause of the pleasant feeling. So we keep eating the cake. So in other words, we're using up all those moments of virtue and then we turn it into dust because it slowly, it, it then because it comes, the action now becomes polluted by attachment and then it will bring suffering results in the future. So it's very technical and important to understand it's not to hear it as something moralistic, you know. Now, the next one is very fascinating. It's called intention. Again, we could spend the rest of the day on this one. Intention, not the way we use it as a, as a synonym for good motivation. Oh, she has a good intention. Not here. This is bare bones, most fundamental one, literally volition. I will. It's the star. And in fact, you could say it. It is the uh, it's the equivalent of mental action karma. If there's no intention, if there's no I will, you will not do something. So the trouble is, all of our intentions are totally motive, are totally programmed in us from countless lives of practice. You know, so we don't even notice that every millisecond there's an intention. Everything we do, if there's no intention, you wouldn't do it. You'd just be sitting here. You know, intention is huge. So there's 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 contact discrimination, the feeling kicks in, then intention is the factor that actualizes what the feeling has started. It actualizes what the feeling has started. So, you know, if the feeling generated upon contact with the cake, let's say, is attraction, then intention moves the mind towards the object. Intention is what brings you to the object. It moves you to the object. You know? This is every millisecond that's happening. Every millisecond. 
so it's also related to motivation, but as he says, be careful here. And the word motivation refers to a grosser level of function because it, it, it's you have to sort of state the motivation, but intention is primordial and way more subtle. So whatever the object, intention actually moves the mind towards it. In other words, intention or volition is a karmic action. So the real meaning of the word karma is mental action. The body and speech then follow after that mental action. That's why it's so important. First level of practice is to control the servants of the mind. Control your body, control your speech. And then you can cut the process of creating negative karma. You know, it's so powerful. Then you've got the luxury to move into the mind. So intention then, it refers to the law. So then basically it's referring to the law of cause and effect as intention, karma. And as Geshe I said, so intention actually is responsible for all our future happiness and suffering because it, it, it's the one that moves towards it and then in, then you start to involved in the action you know so feeling is the cause intention is the result and action in its most subtle and latent form Geshe-la says intention plants the seeds that will ripen it plants the seeds that will ripen as our future happiness or unhappiness and this stuff i mean to be to become to be at the level of actual awareness of all these parts of the mind is super sophisticated. It's the, it's the mind of the greatest yogis, you know? That's where this information is coming from, the experience of the yogis. So as Geshe says, where does intention come from? Why do we make, why do we intend this? Because it's the habit, it's the habit, you know? And that's why you can see with little children or, or animals, I mean, you know, we think we came into this world as a blank slate and mummy and daddy proceed to produce us and make us what we are. No, we come fully programmed with all of our, all of these tendencies, mental tendencies, karmic tendencies from having done them before. So, you know, in the same, for example, I will use that example of this little boy who was the fisherman. The second he saw the fishing, the habit, the habit was there, the karmic habit was there, the seeing of the contact with the fishing triggered it, triggered the memory of it, instantaneously pleasant feeling kicked in, and then attachment kicks in and makes it divine, which is, I mean, I'm, I'm discussing attachment here, not of one of these five mental factors, we're discussing that comes late, that's in another category, but intention, that instantly intention goes in there, I will, I will, I will, you know, so that's why he continued to be a fisherman all his life from past habit, it's from past habit. You look at little, another little boy, you know, a friend, I always quote this one, the son of one of my Buddhist friends, 35 years ago, he's now old, he's 40 something. The soon as he, his mother was taking the lice out of his head and he's instantly crying with compassion for the lice, you know, contact, discrimination, feeling, and then compassion kicked in. Mummy, mummy, leave them alone. Don't hurt them. It's their home. I mean, he wasn't taught and nor was a little fisherman boy taught by their mummies. They got programmed with these intentional, these habits, you know. This is why when we understand this process, we understand karma, you know, we're such junkies. We want pleasant feelings now. We kind of think, well, I'm a good practitioner. I deserve a few good feelings. But even if you don't have any good feelings now because you're, you're purifying like crazy, we should be so happy that we're sowing all the seeds for future good feelings. That's very hard for us because we're all junkies. We want it all now, you know. But to be, that's why to live in vows now is so stupendous, so amazing. We'll go into that in another course, obviously, you know. So it's habit. So habit, of course, it creates tendencies. That's the whole point. So we come into this life fully programmed with our own tendencies. Not mum, and this is a big shock, not mummy's and daddy's tendencies. No, no, that's wrong. They might be the same tendencies as mummy and daddy. So we make the mistake in the materialist model of thinking we got those tendencies from mummy and daddy. Like my mummy was a classical musician, okay? So then she could see that her little Bobsy, me, had a tendency to be good at music. So she taught me singing. So everybody would naturally say, oh, Rabina's good at music because her mother gave her music. My mother was good at music. But no, my mother had the mental tendency to be good at music because she'd practiced it before. And I had the mental tendency to be good at music because I had practiced it before. So each of us separately came programmed into this life with a tendency to be good at music or to be good at football or killing or torturing, whatever we are fortunate or fortunate or not fortunate to have a tendency to do, you know? It's from past habits. So really this is karma. 
Intention is karma, you know. But in terms of a, a current action, the fifth in this process is now attention. So the last always present mental factor is called attention, which focuses the mind on the object to the exclusion of all the others. So the attention comes and then attention homes in and then off you go, you know, engaging in the cake and so on and so forth. You pay attention. Attention also helps to keep the object in front of your mind. Of course it does, you know. So without it, the mind would be unable to remain on it for even a second. Now look at us now with uh, the chocolate cake example, the object of attachment. It is easy to remember the, the, the object of attachment. We think, oh, I can't concentrate. Don't be ridiculous. We have perfected single-pointed concentration. But what are the objects we concentrate on? The objects of attachment. So intention comes in the mind. You home in on the chocolate cake. No one's going to make you forget that chocolate cake. Not for one second. Nothing will distract you because it's, it's re related to this attachment, which we're going to discuss later. But that's what we have to try and cultivate in single-pointed concentration. Attention, we'll go into this, but attention is the part that does the looking at the object. Let's say you're trying to watch your breath. But why do you think it's so difficult to stay on the breath? Well, we're not attached to it, unfortunately. We, are, we, we rush off to think other thoughts, you know. So this is why it's so hard to keep attention staying there. But easy when it's an object of attachment because we've, we've perfected the habit, you know. So also attention is the factor, the mental factor, Geshe says, that filters information. You know, so think of all the vast numbers of, of sensory information we receive every moment. I mean, it's so overwhelming. Imagine our experience if we could not focus on one thing and exclude others. That's why many of us do go crazy. What are we called in the West? OC, all these different words we use. What's the OC? What is that one called? There's all these different words we use in the West. Obsessive but also there's ADHD, ADHD all these, they're, just very, they're all like just variations of the way these states of mind function. So a person who's got completely uncontrolled mind cannot pay attention for more than one second. You see little birds are like that. Little babies are like that. We are like that. Look at us, you know, our minds are out of control, you know. So these five aspects of the mind function together. They're all like the five fingers on a hand. They all do their job beautifully. You know, when you pick up a thermos with your hand, you're not, unless you have been paralyzed and you're trying to practice each one, you don't notice the function. They all do their job perfectly. It's exactly like these five, you know. And so when you're the greatest yogi, then you can start to observe these different parts and train yourself to develop certain parts, right? Okay, how are we going for time? We've already had 50 minutes, my gosh. Yeah, it's like 10 till. I know, that's right. Well, so are there any questions on what I've discussed so far, okay? Any just because we've only got one more, only got one more class left. We're, we're managing, we're doing okay. So are there any questions? Yes. If I, not, totally fine. Then, I, or, uh, Samuel, go ahead. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is, if a person feels compassion towards someone, that compassion feels pleasant. Is, That's that, right. ple is that pleasantness included in the mental factor of feeling? Absolutely, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. But compassion is one state of mind and pleasant feeling is another. But in the case of a person who's habit like that little boy who had compassion for the lice, even though he was in tears, we would tend to think, this is a very good point, we tend to think if we have compassion for somebody and we cry, we would think that's suffering. That's not suffering. Suffering feeling, a suffering feeling is a delusion, is not deluded, sorry, it's triggered, you know, by... Um, it's, it's painful and we wish we, we don't want it, but compassion is a virtue. And then because of his familiarity with compassion, he, you could also say in his mind, there was a pleasant feeling, even though he was in tears of compassion, you could argue that. And of course, it's the fruit of past virtue. No question. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's right. Anybody else? If not, oh yes, Linda or Dave. Linda. Yes. Absolutely. Hi. Um, two questions. The first is sort of really general, and that is about past habits from past lives. Yes. So I can completely see past 
habits in this life. And I don't know how a person gets conviction. Is it through about the past lives? No, I hear you. I hear you, darling. It's a good, good question. So what about those two little children? I just said that example I used. One little boy ran like a magnet to want to kill fish and got very pleasant feelings. And one little boy cried with compassion, even at the thought of the lice in his own head being harmed. Neither of their mothers had taught them this. Each of them, that was their first experience in this life. So you have to ask the question, where did those tendencies come from? That's the question. So then when we get to more deeply into this, that one of the fundamental points that they talk about in Buddhist psychology is that a mental state the main cause, there are secondary causes. So the secondary cause of that mental state of compassion, let's say, for the little boy, for the lice. So the compassion is a mental state that arose upon contact with lice. But that mental state called compassion, you have to ask what's the direct cause of it, the main cause. And the main cause has to be the millionth of a second before of a tendency to be compassionate. And then you ask, well, what was the cause of that moment of compassion, the tendency to be compassionate? It has to be the previous moment of that very continuity of compassion. And if you keep tracking that back, you're going to get back to the first second of conception in that little boy's mother's womb. And then you've got to ask, well, where did that tendency to be compassionate come from? It can only come from a previous imprint in that mind before it even entered into that egg and sperm. And you keep tracking it back and you'll find that that, the Buddha's view, that that consciousness was in a previous body. That's the kind of logic you have to think. So the, the main, I mean, His Holiness was asked one time, how can you prove reincarnation? He said, oh, that's easy. Because you state that the mind is not physical. So the, in general, the main cause of this moment of mind in general has to be the previous millionth of a second of mental consciousness just before. So mind is like a chain of you know, a river of mental moments or an unbroken chain, link of chain of chains of link, you know, links, each one going to the previous moment of itself. So the Buddhist view is consciousness can't be directly the result of something physical. It has to be a direct result of a previous moment of something non-physical called that continuity of mind. And then you be specific. So the anger that, or the, 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 the wish to kill that arose in that other little boy's mind, that's the fruit of a tendency in his mind to kill. And you track that back to a previous tendency in his four-year-old mind. And then when he was three and when he was two, they were latent at that point. And then when he was one and then finally back into his mother's womb. And then you track it back to the previous life where he had done the killing, which leaves an imprint to have the tendency to keep killing. And then when he meets the object in this life, makes contact with fishing, the thought arises, I will kill. That's the type of analysis to do. What do you think, Linda? That helps. Thank you very much. Good. That's the thinking to do, you know. Of course, we're taking the view here. We're working with the hypothesis that consciousness is, is this non-physical you know, entity. That's the thinking. To, that's the analysis to do. Of course, the one we use in our culture, you know, and there can be some truth in that. Like my mother, we would say, is the main cause of my tendency to be good at music or my being good at music, and it comes from the genes and the DNA and so forth. And you can still see there's some, uh, there's some truth in that at some level. But the fundamental point in Buddhism is that I came into this life with the tendency to be good at music because I'd done it before. In other words, my mother was good at music, but if I didn't have a tendency to be good at music, she could teach me till the cows come home, I would never be good at music. So that she did teach me. She's one of the cooperative causes, not the main cause of my being good at music. That's the way to think about it. So like the little boy, say the fisherman, maybe his daddy was good at fishing and he taught him how to fish. Well, the same as me with my mother and the music. The daddy was a secondary cause. I mean, my, my father used to go fishing. I would look at the fishing rod. There's not even a thought arose in my mind. I didn't even think I don't want to fish. I certainly didn't think I do want to fish. And even I remember never thinking about fishing. And then one, we used to have, we had this um, Lithuanian uncle 
his Lithuanian. Oh, my book's running out of battery. Never mind. My my Lithuanian uncle. He was a you know he was a he was a peasant and he was and he you know so he bought a, my auntie married him my auntie Rabina Bliss, who was my mother's sister married him and she became Rabina Akushowskis. I always remember that. She was Rabina Bliss before that. So she had to, she hated all this thing. And he, he, he loved all his fishing. So he bought this property up on the river between, you know, in, in the country. And my poor aunt, we called her Ninny. She had to skin the rabbits and skin the fish and skin the whale. So he killed the quails in the quail season, the ducks in the duck season, the eels in the eel season, the fish in the fish season. He was wonderful. He was very generous with his animals. And we go up there swimming, right? I remember, I'll never forget, I'd never thought of fishing. I'd never arose in my mind but I remember I was lying there sunbaking on the riverbank and we went up there for the river not for the fishing and suddenly Stasi we called him his name was Stasis we called him Stasi so Stasi would come home with his drunk of course with his mates always they got drunk and he'd come with his bag of fish and I mean I was lying in this hot sun and then suddenly he empties this bag of, of fish and I'm completely shocked I see all these fish and they're all alive I said Stasi they're still alive I didn't think about fishing. I didn't know that fish died an agonizing slow death. He said, he laughed. He said, that's how they die, he said. And he walked away, you know. Now, I was completely shocked. I'd never thought of it. And immediately I had compassion because there was no barrier in my mind because I've had no tendency to kill, you know. So, But he had the tendency to kill. So this is the tragedy. He couldn't see the suffering. He just laughed, couldn't see the suffering, you know. That's the tragedy of the habit to harm when you're attached to it. The attachment makes it delicious. You can't see the harm you're doing. This is the tragedy of attachment to do negative actions because the habit. So what I'm getting at is I didn't have a habit to kill. Aren't I lucky? I mean, I must have lived in vows in the past, you know. Anyway, Ninja, that's my long answer. We have two more questions in the chat. Oh, yes. Absolutely. One from Anna. Anna, would you like to turn on your mic? Yes, Anna. Or would yes, you hello, to... hello. Yes, sweetheart. Yes, so should I read out the question or? Yes, please, you may read the question. So I was asking if a person cannot find an intention in her or his life and doesn't present any particular habit, for instance, cannot find place in the world for herself, is, is no, that a, a karmic thing? I understand, oh, I understand, yes. darling. I understand, yes. Is that it? More to say? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. My so, darling, I think the, the level that we're discussing here is much, 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 much more subtle. We're talking about intention every millisecond. If this person you're describing doesn't have any intention, you would not even move your body. Your mind would just become completely nothing. You So intention that you're describing is trying to find meaning in your life. That's another whole discussion. That's another whole discussion, darling. So my answer to for that person would be, you know, um, to have this aspiration. I don't know what's best to do in my life. I don't know what my purpose in life is. I cannot see what is most beneficial, but I want to know. So have the aspiration. I want to do what's most beneficial. I want to find a purpose in life. You start with the thought, sweetheart. And that is intention. That's a very conscious intention. Uh, intention really, uh, Lama Zopa puts it, there's a saying in Tibetan, everything exists on the tip of the wish so if you don't know what your motivation is if you don't know what your purpose is you start with the thought i want to find my purpose may i find my purpose may i find what is best to do everything exists on the tip of the wish having that thought every day sweetheart one day you'll go oh there it is that's my recommendation okay anna Yes, great. Thank you. That's really good. Good, good, good. good. So do it every day. Who else? We, Any questions we, about what we've discussed so far? The we have mental factors. Yes, we have one more from Mark. Yes, Mark. I think he might want to ask. Uh, the difference between a mental factor and an affliction. In uh, Don Hendricks' uh, class, he talked about. Uh, a mental factor in the three poisons being attachment and anger and ignorance being an affliction and anger and attachment being a mental factor. So the difference between a 
state of mind, a mental factor, and an affliction. Well, I don't know. I mean, that may, I don't know what he's. I don't. I don't understand what he's saying. All I know is, if we look, we're going to get into that very soon. The six root afflictions, they call them, and and ignorance is one is one of those in there. But we'll go into that when we get to the afflictions. We'll go into those, Mark. We'll see what uh, Don is saying. He's being. He's, he's making a more fine point. You know. So yeah, and they generally those three poisons. So the root, the root delusion is indeed ignorance. And when that, when you realize emptiness, you cut that. But I mean, it's in the list. I mean, later on we get to them. Where are they? Concentration, recollection. We'll get to them eventually. The variables, and then we've got the three. I guess I've got a different category here. Way of doing. We'll get to those later. We'll get into those later, and we'll look into what he's saying. Okay. So here we're looking at these all. Okay, but thank you, Mark. We'll go into that later. And okay, so the next category, are they more? That's no, that, I was just going to say that's the last. Thank you. Good, okay. So the next category, they call them the object ascertaining mental factors. The sort of the, the term is fairly evident, isn't it? So there are five of these. They're called aspiration, appreciation, recollection. This, and the trouble is, the different scholars use different terms. So, Mark, I don't know what Don Hendrick is saying because there are different terminologies. Maybe T.Y. Alexander's terms are different from the ones we're using here. This is the problem. If we don't know the Tibetan, we get very confused, you know. So you've got to look at to try and find the way to see because recollection is can be used as, I think, mindfulness can be the word that people sometimes use for recollection. But let's see what Geshe is saying. Aspiration, appreciation, recollection, concentration, and intelligence. So I mean, for example, I think Jeffrey Hopkins, the professor Jeffrey Hopkins has his own terms and many people use his terminology. I don't know whether Geshe Tashi is using his terminology or not. Uh, one moment, Venerable, your mic has uh, gone out. I can't hear you, let's see. Can't hear you yet. I see you waving. <laughs> Let's see, I don't think, did we mute you? I don't think. Oh yeah, I'm there you are. Oh, it's out again. Okay. There we go. All right, because I'm sitting with my iPad and it's sitting on my shift button, you see, so I have to get a ah. shift button. <laughs> okay, mute, good. okay, so, okay, good. So as Geshe says, the always present mental fact. So, okay, sorry, now I'm leaping. Object ascertaining. So if the first group is like the engine, this group is what really shapes the mind's experience, okay? And again, you'd say all of these are neither negative nor positive. It's a really, see, this is a crucial distinction. They don't go on too much about that here, but it's really a massively important distinction to understand. It's a very specific thing in Buddhist psychology that, there's a that, that there are those states of mind, the afflictions as they call them, that are delusional, disturbing, neurotic, are not at the core of our being and can be removed, and the virtuous states of mind that are the source of happiness. These are not the source of happiness or suffering. It's how you use Use them that determines the results that will come. That's why I like to call these the mechanics of the mind. This is my term, you know. So these mental factors ascertain the object of the main mind, taking the clay of raw sense data and molding it into the finished sculpture. It's a good way of putting it, you know. So how close the ascertained object is to reality depends on how deluded or enlightened the ascertaining mind is. So the first one, aspiration. It's, it, it's similar to intention insofar as it moves us towards an object of attachment or away from an object of aversion. See, many of these states of mind almost, it's almost like splitting hairs, but they are got, each got their own very specific function. I mean, you could do very well, and I usually in my teachings, I mainly talk about attachment and aversion, just two delusions. There's way more going on. But if we can become familiar, even with its attachment and aversion, we can really know ourselves well, you know. But this, this is much more intricate in the details, and we need to know this. 
So basically aspiration is the wish to engage in a particular activity and a strong interest in the process, you know. It might be conscious, a strong conscious decision or at an unconscious level, meaning because it's a habit, you know. So, but aspiration differs from intention. So although they're similar, intention is much more basic, you know, and acts as one of the fundamental aspects of any state of mind. Whereas aspiration is a result of the many processes occurring and is not always present. So, I mean, this is where it's so intricate, these details are so fascinating, you know, we start to know them theoretically and then we can start to see them working in our own mind, you know. So also as in terms of Dharma practice, let's say, and any, any practice, aspiration functions as the basis for enthusiasm. Well, you know perfectly well when you're studying the Mahayana teachings and you study the six perfections of a bodhisattva, the fourth is called joyful effort or enthusiasm. And all the lamas say that you're not going to, and this is in, in life in general, you, you will never be successful if you don't have enthusiasm. And that's pretty evident. So technically, of course, when they discuss it in the Mahayana, in the six perfections, enthusiasm is only referring to enthusiasm to practice virtue, that enthusiasm to practice non-virtue, enthusiasm to practice attachment is actually not even enthusiasm. But we can see it in general. That's what we and why we have enthusiasm to eat food, enthusiasm to do anything. Aspiration is a key function in this process. And of course, to try and see it as a virtue is a key. It's a key part of our Buddhist practice, as Krishna says. For example, hearing that it is possible to end samsara, to stop suffering, you know, we become inspired and we aspire towards that goal. This is a powerful mind, though the end of samsara will not come about through aspiration alone, no matter how fervent. But it's a very powerful stepping stone, you know, and this is what we need to cultivate in our practice. Otherwise, we'll never achieve anything. Without enthusiasm, you will not achieve anything because the opposite is called laziness, which is kind of counterintuitive, but it's very interesting, you know. So the next one is called appreciation. So is the wish to attain or possess the object. Appreciation is the mental factor that develops that part of us, you know. So seeing the ascertained object, like the cake, has qualities that are worthwhile, appreciation stabilizes the relationship with the object by directing the mind towards it more forcefully. I mean, if you analyze this, you can see it working, you know. There's contact made, the habit in the, in the, the habit in the mind to attach to chocolate cake from habit before. You see the cake, you make contact, you discriminate, then, you know, attach, well, attachment haven't got to that yet. But these other ones all kicking in, all doing their job, you know. The aspiration, I mean, that's usually related to as a, I mean, I'm not sure if aspiration is even a virtue. I don't think it is. No, it's more fundamental. Yeah. But I think they tend to use the word aspiration in relation to something virtuous, you know, appreciation. It has the function of wanting the object and securing its and securing its um, recollection. So you say you're reading this in your living room and on the coffee table in front of you are a great assortment of objects. So what directs your eye consciousness towards one object? recollection recollecting that scene later what mental factor is responsible for one object being remembered clearly but not the other so feeling is just that you know attachment aversion or indifference to an object appreciation takes this one step further in recognizing the quality in the object so if i'm remembering all the thermoses I'll recognize the qualities of this particular thermos, you know, because I, I remember the design of it. And that's the one I remember. I recollect and I appreciate it. I reckon and I appreciate it. It appreciates the object in the recognition of the quality, whether positive, negative or neutral. You know? Then the next one is recollection. It's the ability of the mind to return to the object. 
So it's different from appreciation in that appreciation can ascribe a quality to the object, but doesn't have the ability to return to it. So with recollection, I wonder what other terms are used for recollection. I should look at the different ones, you know. He doesn't say here. He doesn't say, he just uses it, recollection. I mean, you could see it seems like remembering, isn't it? Remembering, you know. Or memory, even it could be this one. I mean, I know that often mindfulness, which is the ability to not forget what you're doing moment by moment, which is a crucial thing to cultivate in uh, in meditation, you know. But I mean, it's not a virtue either. Remember, Lama Zopa says thieves need mindfulness, and it's the, it's really what we call short term memory, the, the, the ability to remember. So maybe his word recollection is the word for mindfulness. I don't know yet. I have to look at all the others. I forget. I think it could be that. I think it's what people might be referring to as mindfulness. So the continuous application of recollection acts, yeah, it would be, acts as the basis for concentration. So mindfulness, if this is the one he's referring to, is this ability to go back to the object and then just not forget it. And then that brings concentration. This is what we're trying to cultivate in meditation, you know. It's the basis of memory. So he says, you know, for example, if you enter the gompa of a Tibetan monastery, the strong Tibetan incense, my battery's down to 5%. How are we going for time? I've got to plug it in then. I'm going to run out. Excuse me, I have to leave you for a second. Yes. Buddha, yes. Buddha instead of me for a minute, okay? <laughs> no problem. Okay, here we go. Plug in. All right. So he says, when you enter the Gompa of a Tibetan monastery, the strong Tibetan incense has a very distinctive smell. If it's your first visit, you know, you're not actually recollecting the smell. It's being stored in your memory. And this is something very fascinating. Just by the way, I love this little tidbit. The Buddhist view is there's not a single second of any person's mental and sensory experiences that is not stored in our memory. That's why eventually you can have clairvoyance and you can remember all your past lives and all the past lives of all beings because this capacity is the function of is, is 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 what we can develop this is pretty stunning you know well, i mean we think of we think of like a, we maybe write one book of memories of our of our life but i mean even just today and for me it's 12 noon if i had to sit down and, re, and write down every tiny experience since i was awake this morning we'd all be an absolute miserable failure because our memory is so limited right now but everything i've experienced since i woke up is stored in my memory so eventually you can learn to access it. I find that quite fascinating, you know. So in the so it's being stored in your memory. So whenever you smell that incense in the future, you find yourself back in that gompa. It's your recollection that takes you there. We know this from our from how that's why many people have awful experiences when they're little. You try to hide them, but you can't. That's why what's that other thing we call in the West? PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. We Those memories are in the mind, but we try to put them away. But you cannot avoid it. They're going to come up one way or another. And that's why if we're really practicing Dharma and we learn with courage every day to greet our experiences and not have aversion, then we would never have PTSD. It would not be possible. If we were able to deal every second with what arises in our lives, instead of pushing it away because it's so unbearable, then we would not have PTSD. We'd be stable. And this is what we can become. This is what's so amazing in Buddhist psychology. We've got the ability to deal with things moment by moment so that we can become these powerful, strong, brave, courageous, optimistic beings. You know, we wouldn't have such a thing as fears. We wouldn't have them. This is what we're capable of, actually. It's very interesting. 
So, you know, so like, that's why he's saying here, whenever you smell that incense, you'll find yourself back in that gompa. It's your recollection that takes you there. So if you associate that smell with peace and happiness, then the feeling that will, that will be the feeling and will arise in your mind. But if you're allergic to incense, you just remember the sneezing. <laughs> it's so true. Or you'll just associate it with a bad thing. So you want to not remember it, you know. That's why people can't stand remembering bad things, you know can't bear it we can't it's too painful to look at them which is the arising of, of aversion and now you've got concentration so although we call this one concentration that may be slightly misleading as it often refers to a consciously willed activity but concentration in this context is merely the ability of the mind to remain on the object it doesn't, it's not kind of qualitative, you know. It's simply, so if recollection brings us back to the object again and again, concentration has the sense of holding that object. So our ability to hold the object is completely dependent upon our connection with the experience. So if we're trying to focus on the wish to be free from samsara, but the motivation is not really there, our minds will move to another object quite readily. I mean, don't we know that, you know? But whereas if you're a you've got aspiration to have that chocolate cake, you know the benefits, you remember it, you go there, nothing will stop your concentration. You think about this, you could be in the middle of a football field of 50,000 screaming people, but if you're, and if you're angry with your boyfriend, nothing will take your concentration away from that anger. You don't say, be quiet, I'm trying to be angry. Your concentration is really good. You keep staying on that object. You know the benefits, you've aspired to do it, you focus, and, and then we can see our minds, you know, and we can, that's why we can see it's so hard to focus, to concentrate on virtue. We can see this, this is why it's so difficult. <coughs> and then the fifth one, he calls it intelligence, but sometimes people call this wisdom, which sounds a bit grand. Intelligence. So the common usage of the word intelligence differs from the meaning intended here. Conventionally, intelligence is the opposite of stupidity, okay? Oh, my battery is still low. What happened? Why isn't it bat Why isn't it charging? Okay, I think it is, hopefully. Not charging. Yes, I hope it is charging. So here, we're talking about something much more subtle, he's saying, this, this intelligence. Here we're talking about something that's the ability of the mind. This is the thing. It's a very precise capacity. I'm saying these words now to examine something, to analyze something and to determine its value by seeing that, the, that it has certain characteristics that make it ugly or beautiful or whatever. It's, it's a discerning mind. A very, it's, a, it's a capacity for good discernment. That's what I mean by this intelligence here, you know. And then it brings us a degree of certainty. So you, and again, you can see this is not negative or positive. A person who is really good at, um, you know, you could use this to really analyze something and seeing it as, you know, to, like to make a really good gun. That's just, or people who use it for, for like general things, like the ability to analyze things and be very precise and very scientific about things. So it's not virtuous in its nature at all, but it can be, we utterly need it. When we combine it with a pure motivation and practicing virtue, you've got to have this sherab. I think of the term in Tibetan is sherab. Wisdom they often refer to. So the, the so this is just this is just a summary of them. This is what Geshe is saying. So these ten already we've got we've covered ten. You know, twenty past. So as Geshe says, the always present are always there. But the object ascertaining are not. Their presence is dependent on the degree to which our minds explore the object. Not falling into the category always present suggests that they do not all operate in every mental event. And traditionally, this is what is stated. But I feel that generally these five will almost always operate. This is Geshe saying his view. If we have any focus at all, then all five must be operating. However, they do operate at different degrees, some very actively, some hardly at all. 
So perhaps, for example, our aspiration to progress on the spiritual path might be very strong, but our intelligence, our wisdom is low or vice versa. You know? Okay, so just, I think that's enough for now for these 51. We've done 10 of them. Are there any general questions about the mind or anything else you'd like to discuss? Because when you have your discussion, whoever, however many of you have your discussion, use T, I mean, I've used Geshe-Las now, and you're going to see TYs. I don't know if her terms are different. You're going to have to look at this. But it'd be really good to go through these 10 in your discussion, just very briefly, go through each one, and using T.Y. Alexander's course notes, because you'll recognize each one, even if her terms are different. So ask me questions, sweethearts. I have a question in the chat box, or please raise your hand. No um, questions. All right. Okay. I don't see any. No, I think it's okay. That's good. But I think yeah. if we hear the words, they all really make sense, you know. But it's, see, what's it's it's what's marvelous is we can begin to think about these different bits of our mind all working together. And now, when we start to go into the next week, we'll go into the delusions. Maybe I can even start now because we're not going to have much time left. Let's just go into the. He talks about the variable, but we'll go into those later. Don't worry about these. I have one quick question. Oh, uh, yeah. You're referring to Geshe-La's book. Uh, what's the name of the book? In your course notes. It's referred to in your course notes. Okay. It's called Buddhist Psychology. In the back. Okay, thank you. In the back. It's one of the two books that's recommended. Yeah. Buddhist Psychology by Geshe Tashi, published by Wisdom. Okay. And he taught this at our London Centre, and that's the publishing of his course notes, you know. So I think here are the, un, as he calls them, the unwholesome or, neg you know, non-virtuous mental factors vulnerable if possible we do have one question in the chat oh, good. okay then. I mean, it's a good one <laughs> good, um, does a buddha have the mental factor of feeling of course he wouldn't exist if he didn't of course except they're only having blissful feelings they only ever have blissful feelings. of course absolutely you wouldn't i mean how could you not have a feeling you'd be you wouldn't exist if you had a mind you wouldn't exist if there weren't feeling but for the buddha there's only you know you could argue there's only blissful feelings i mean you could argue that there's no negative there's no unpleasant feelings that's for sure not a possibility and that's why it's so important when we think of like i said before when we think of compassion we think when you cry when you see suffering you think you are suffering no by definition not possible compassion compassion it might trigger unpleasant feelings because you're interpreting it wrongly but i mean un, i mean the buddha has infinite compassion but and even though like dalai lama is said to be a buddha okay we'll just assume he is let's just say he is we don't know we're not clairvoyant and then every time the tibetans come over the mountains and come to dharamsala and there they are weeping telling him their stories about their suffering and his holiness is in tears we think oh poor his holiness he must be suffering not a possibility that's what you've got to understand Unpleasant feelings could only be triggered by a past negative karma ripening as an unpleasant feeling. Well, the Buddha's finished all his rubbish. There's not a possibility to have an unpleasant feeling. Impossible. This is a quite interesting point. So, of course, the Buddha has feeling. My goodness. Absolutely. Any questions? Any more? That was a good one. <laughs> So, okay, he's got, a, he's got his own little way of doing it. Now I'm going to get confused. Maybe I should go to T.Y. Alexander's course notes. I'm a bit lost now. Hang on. He's got a whole different level. He puts all these different ones at different levels of them. Some are more intense, some are less intense. He's got his own yeah. style. Yeah, it's a little bit different in the, the handout book, a couple of the words. I know that. And Yeah. The handout book is by T.Y. Alexander. Yeah. T.Y. Alexander. Yes. I don't know, his list here is a bit complicated. So the three main, see, he calls them here, very simple, Mark. He refers to them as the three mental, the three main mental afflictions. He calls them right there. So I don't know what, I don't know where Don's coming from because I haven't heard everything and I'm not, you know, Don's a scholar, so I don't know. So the main mental afflictions, or the, the word, okay, this is word interesting. I find this word very fascinating. Let's look at the word affliction. Klesha in Sanskrit. This is the classic word used in Buddhist texts, you know. But what's fascinating, Lama Yeshi, when I was editing, when I edited his books, he was very amazing, Lama Yeshi. He kind of just 
intuited the right words to say. He was quite astonishing, you know. And he never, I see it in his teachings, he never used the word affliction. And I think in Mahamudra, this marvelous book that he, um, that, that we, that's come out recently that I happened to edit, that he taught in the early 80s in Australia, um, you know, he talks about, he, I think I identified like 21 synonyms that Lama had made up, basically, to be equivalents of affliction because affliction i don't think he just i think he just knew in english it's a it's a boring word who uses the word in your daily life who says i have an affliction i don't think so so it's very classically buddhist so what is what are the words well you know i find this very fascinating we've got the negative or the you know negative states or generally speaking there, there are distinctions but would be very broad here these three categories i always emphasize this a lot the neurotic deluded disturbing afflicted, negative, unhappy, ridiculous states of mind that have the characteristic of being misconceptions, deeply disturbing, the source of our pain and the source of why we harm others, which the Buddha says we can get rid of, which is the job to be done here. Then you have the virtues, the positive love, compassion, kindness, generosity, or the positive states of mind. So the term for the first lot, I never also I never use the word affliction. So what are the words? So delusion is a really perhaps one of the functions of these afflictions. So then you have to ask the question, well, what kind of affliction? Well, Geshe Sopa in Wisconsin, who's who's five volumes of his commentary that he took 25 years to give on the Lam Rim. He used the Lam Rim Chenmo as his basis, and he took 25 years to teach it, and it's published in five volumes by Wisdom. He would refer to mental afflictions, which is a good start. That's the term that Geshe Tashi uses. We're getting a bit closer to home because a headache is an affliction, isn't it? Being Having a knee ache is an affliction. Being poor is an affliction. But what are we talking here? We're talking afflictions that are in the mind. So at least mental affliction is a good term. So, but what, but the term I like to use is all the time delusion, which is a really crucial one to understand. But, you know, I think another term, and this is too shocking for our culture. It's an, an, an illness is an affliction. You say, if you're ill, you have an, you're afflicted by illness. Well, let's say another word for affliction is the word illness. Well, what kind of illness folks? A physical illness? No, Buddha's not describing those. He's called, he's referring to a mental illness. So speaking really accurately for the Buddha, attachment, anger, jealousy, pride, low self-esteem, depression, anxiety, they are mental illnesses. I think this is so accurate, but you listen to it. It's so shocking, isn't it? We can't hear it. So it's, so it's sort of safe to say an affliction. Oh, yeah, the, look at the afflictions. Buddha talks about the afflictions. Oh, wow, well, I've got an affliction. You know, I'm so oh, affliction, but I'm ill. I've got a mental illness. It's too shocking for our minds. But it's a very excellent synonym, I would suggest. It's so accurate. It's so precise. But, you know, in our culture, when you say you've got a mental illness, we are embarrassed, we are ashamed, we live in denial, and it's people way down the end of the spectrum, isn't it? It's the ones who are mentally ill, who are psychotics, who are deeply chronically depressed, who live in HDAD or ODID or OCD or whatever. We have all these labels. And I'm not being sarcastic here. I'm trying to show how we make this massive distinction in our ordinary world between what the Buddha refers to as attachment, anger, jealousy. Oh, yeah, I've got those. They're afflictions. But mental illness, no, 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 I'm not mentally ill. We're not thinking to, We're not thinking properly. We're not joining all the dots. We're not really looking at it carefully, you know. This is Buddha's entire point. So he's not, it's not exaggerating to say, if you are quote unquote in samsara, then by definition, you have ignorance, the root affliction. And then on the basis of this, you have attachment. And on the basis of that, you have aversion. Then by definition, you are mentally ill. That's it. It's just a question of degree. And this is not playing with words. So it's really important to think like this. You know, this is Buddha's amazing analysis of how to get mentally healthy, how to give up suffering. 
We've got to see it in, in these types of terms, not as some separate, interesting religious thing over here in the corner and real life and real psychology is here in front of me. It's not like that, you know. That for me is incredibly beneficial to think this way. So next week we're going to go into the neuroses, okay? Buddha would have liked all these fancy Greek words. Neurosis is a good word, you know. Okay, honeys, so you do your discussions. Please discuss, whoever's want to stay on, you're very welcome, to do the 10. Go through these 10. Use TY's examples, and she'll, you'll see, you'll recognize from what I just said. And they're really easy to hear, and they're quite a revelation. These 10 are very delicious, so think about them, okay? Discuss them based on what you've heard and based on the course notes. Okay, sweethearts, good enough? Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, everybody. Thank Dear you. Spirit. Thank you, Venerable Rubina. Keep looking. Keep Thank you, Venerable Rubina. And every second of this is referring to your mind. Don't keep thinking of your grandmother or your auntie. One of the commonest things that happens when we go to the teachings, we think, oh, I wish my boyfriend was here. He needs to hear this. We need to hear it. Okay, darling. Thank you very much. So what I just said was make body chi to grow and grow and all these seeds we planted this 90 minutes gone like a dream. May we nourish these seeds with our effort from this second forward. So we do become a Buddha eventually, just as we motivated. Okay, for the sake of all suffering beings. All right, precious one. Thank you, darling.